Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today for our stellar spacecraft program. My name is Alicia. I'll be your host today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering our programming, please click on the link in the description or the comments. So everyone, feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before, or maybe if you plan on visiting us sometime soon. We have some really exciting stuff coming up. And of course, if you've got any questions today, you can feel free to pop them in there as well. Now, today we are going to be talking about spacecraft landers, specifically things that have landed both here on Earth as well as on the moon and even on other planets. But before we get to those, let's recap a bit, as we usually do, all about the Intrepid itself and our special connection to space. Why are we even talking about this space stuff in the first place? Well, everyone, in case you weren't already familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located in a historic World War II era aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed way back in 1943 and is now a museum docked just a few blocks away from Times Square in Manhattan, right on the Hudson River. So maybe you visited before, maybe you're looking forward to visiting us again sometime soon in the future, but either way, if you are in the neighborhood passing by, it's kind of hard to miss. <laughs> we like to say that the Intrepid is actually so big that if you stood it up on its end, it would be taller than a New York City skyscraper. And it's also so long that you could just about play three games of football on it at the exact same time. Now, the Intrepid served in three wars. World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And then a few years later, in 1982, we became the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum that we all know and love. But sometimes, you know, visitors get a little confused and they wonder, all right, well, why, why are you a Sea, Air, and Space Museum? What's that space part all about? So, yeah, all right, let's rewind for just a second for those of you who are new. We are, of course, a sea museum because we are a naval ship, as you can see here. In fact, this is just one of the other four propellers, actually, on the right of that picture there, uh, that were on the Intrepid. It pushed it through the water. So it's now actually inside on display at the Intrepid if you want to see it. So, yeah, we've obviously got some pretty strong ties to the sea. But, you know, there are some other different types of propellers. Here's another one on the front of this plane here. So this is the Avenger from World War II. This is the oldest plane in our collection. This one was a torpedo bomber. So you can actually see the torpedo underneath it there. So this is just one of the reasons why we are an air museum, okay? The Intrepid carried a number of airplanes in its time and service. In fact, they could fit up to about 100 airplanes on the ship at the time there. And uh, it also had the ability to launch and land them too, just like you might do at an airport. So we like to say we're actually basically like a floating airport. Later on during the Cold War, though, we had another kind of planes. We had these jet planes like the Fury here. They moved a lot faster. They did not use propellers, as you can see. And we also even had helicopters, too, which were used to rescue people from the ocean. So, OK, yep, clearly we are also an air museum because we are an aircraft carrier, right? We carried aircraft. We have a bunch of airplanes and helicopters, but oh, we're still not really sure about space, right? Well take a look at this. Hmm. Now, you know, if you're walking around the hangar deck of the Intrepid, you're going to see a lot of planes, helicopters, things like that. And then you'll see this thing. And I got to admit, it does kind of stick out a little bit. <laughs> there are a bunch of sea and air things. And then this thing. Does anyone out there know what this thing is? Go ahead and tell me in the chat if you do. We are looking at this big, black, kind of almost light bulb shaped looking thing. If you look closely, it says United States on it, on the side. It's even got an American flag there. Might give us a clue of who was using this vehicle. Some people, when they look at it, they actually say it kind of looks like an ice cream cone that's been tilted on its side. Uh, kind of a sad thing, if that's the case. Um, or, you know, even a megaphone, something that you shout into to, you know, have your voice project. But everyone, this is actually a very special vehicle. And uh, it's something called a space capsule, all right? Let me know in the chat, too, how many people do you think could fit inside of this thing? doesn't look very big, right? 
But this thing's called the space capsule, like I said, and it is the thing that takes astronauts up into space, and especially our earliest astronauts. Now, the capsules would ride on top of a rocket. The rocket, of course, is the thing that goes up into space. It brings it up there. There's all that fire that comes out of the bottom, oftentimes when you see it on screen, on TV, right? And then once it gets into space, the capsule separates from that rocket, and then the capsule stays there and keeps floating around in outer space to complete some missions. So these capsules were part of the earliest stages of our space program, what they called Project Mercury, which was really just to see if people could even reach outer space and survive up there for a while in the first place. Now, the thing that you're looking at here is actually a replica of one of those early capsules called the Mercury Aurora 7. And uh, if any of you out there said it fits one person inside, you would be correct, because as you can see, it is pretty small pretty tight in there for a full-grown man, right? Now, in 1962, the astronaut who went into space on the Aurora 7 was this guy. His name was Scott Carpenter. There he is next to the Mercury Atlas rocket that took him up into space. And Scott Carpenter uh, was actually only up in outer space for about five hours. He did three orbits around the Earth before then safely coming back down to Earth. But this is really important, guys. If you have this big spacecraft hurtling back down towards, you know, the atmosphere and back through the atmosphere, it's kind of important to pick a good landing spot, right? You don't want to land on someone's house or anything like that. And also you got to think about how you can land safely too. So they decided the best place to land one of these capsules on land would be the ocean. And, you know, thinking about our planet Earth, right? It's about 70% water anyway. So it's a good, easy target, a lot safer, a little softer, nice, softer landing spot. Definitely. So actually that picture on the right there, you can see Scott Carpenter um, after landing in the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. There's big a parachutes that came out to help slow him down on top to decrease the drag or increase the drag rather to slow the capsule down as it came in to get to a safer speed, of course. And that is called splashdown. But after splashdown, something this big is going to land in the ocean. NASA still, of course, has to go pick it up and pick him up again, right? You can't just leave your astronauts stranded in the middle of the ocean. That's not nice. So as you can see in that picture on the right there, they sent out a helicopter to go rescue him. But in this case, when they got to the place he was supposed to be, they actually couldn't find him. And that is because while he was wrapping up his experiments up there, he did get a little distracted and he ended up firing his re-entry thrusters two seconds too late. And as a result, that threw him miles and miles off course, up to about over 200 miles off course, actually. Well, fortunately, everything was fine. Eventually, they were able to track him down, and he was just fine. So they picked him up. They flew him to the closest airport that was in the water, which, uh, well, just happened to be the Intrepid. So there we go. We've got this wonderful connection to our early space history. And in fact, here he is on board the ship. These are some photos from our collection. There he is surrounded by officers and onlookers while on our ship after being picked up from his capsule in 1962. A very, very momentous occasion. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are a space museum. The Intrepid played a very important role in retrieving astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. Now, the Mercury capsule wasn't the only one that we picked up, though. We also got to pick up another one, and it came from this part of our space program. This is the next series of missions called the Gemini missions, Project Gemini. All right, and this one in particular was named after the constellation of Gemini, the twins, if you've ever heard of that, because it was the very first time now that NASA sent two astronauts up into space together inside of this capsule. It was a little bit bigger, as you can see here. On board Gemini 3, we had John Young, who you can see on the left, and Gus Grissom, who you can see on the right in that photograph on the right there. So these two guys went up into outer space. They also orbited around the Earth three times, and then just like we saw in Mercury, they splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. So here is actually a picture of the Intrepid retrieving the Gemini capsule from the ocean in 1965. These guys landed where they were supposed to land, fortunately. And I love this photo so much on the left. You can really actually see, uh, well, first of all, that yellow kind of thing around it there, that's a flotation collar. They used it to help keep it floating on the water while it's waiting to be picked up. 
But I love this photo so much. You can see all the sailors lined up along the side of the ship. So exciting to be part of history like that. Uh, but actually, yeah, that flotation collar, actually, to go back to that, that was important because uh, Gus Grissom, who was on that capsule, one of those astronauts, um, he actually was one of our earliest astronauts as well. He was on an earlier mission, an earlier Mercury capsule called the Liberty Bell 7. And when he landed in the ocean, his door accidentally got blown off. It opened up when he landed and the capsule actually started to fill up with water and it sunk. Now, luckily he was fine. He was rescued in time, but his capsule did not fare so well. So it did sink uh, to the bottom of the ocean and it took them over 20 years to find it and uh, pull it back up again. So adding that floaty like that was very important to make sure that they were all kept safe after landing. So these earlier missions, everyone, had a lot of experiments going on, a lot of tests to see how humans would, again, just even fare in outer space, and really had to get that equipment just right before getting to our ultimate goal, which of course was heading all the way off to Locoland on the moon. So before we head off to the next era of space flight, I just want to pause and see if we have any other questions, any questions at all um, about anything that I've covered so far, maybe uh, any of our early space program or anything like that. Let's see. All right, why did they only send up two astronauts during the Gemini missions? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier um, that the Mercury missions were pretty short, right? Also pretty small. That capsule only had one person inside, right? Uh, so NASA was basically taking baby steps there. If you imagine each stage of NASA's missions as a life phase of the growth of a person, of a human, right? You can kind of think of it like the Mercury missions um, are just the baby steps. You know, you're a newborn, you're just learning how to breathe in space. You're just eating baby food, literally applesauce like John Glenn did up there. Um, and just very simple, you know, motor skills, just kind of figuring out how to just move around, survive up there, very basic. So the Gemini missions next were kind of the toddler stage where now you've got this opportunity to learn how to walk, right? This was the first time that we took our first extravehicular activity, EVAs, spacewalks, right? So that was very significant. Um, this was also the first time during Gemini that we were docking with another ship. So, you know, we like to say that's kind of like you're making friends in space. And now at this phase, you're also able to do things like eat harder foods as well, right? They had much better foods, not just the applesauce. So, um, you know, to answer that question, why do they only send up two? Um, again, it's really just part of those baby steps. We we didn't want to send up a whole bunch of people at one time just in case something went wrong. And uh, we were just kind of learning, just doing little baby steps, little progress here and there to make things bigger and better and also to conserve energy, conserve fuel and oxygen. Got to think about all those things, even just like food, how much how much space it takes up up there and the weight. Um, but eventually, once everyone got to space and once we get to the space shuttle era, now we're sending seven, eight people at a time. But again, just wanted to do it sequentially take our time getting into space and make sure everyone was a-okay. Great question. Any others? Did all capsules land in the Atlantic Ocean? No, they didn't. Um, so these two that we talked about today so far, um, they did land in the Atlantic Ocean. At the time, they were being launched from Florida. So they were landing in the Atlantic Ocean down near, you know, the Bahamas and that area. Uh, and it was just easier for them to be able to then retrieve the capsule and take it back to their headquarters to you know, pull off any data that they needed out of it um, and learn whatever they needed to learn from those important missions. But later on, they actually uh, did land in the Pacific. Um, Apollo 11, actually, for instance, the one that landed on the moon, um, did land there. Uh, and there were also other spacecraft that landed, believe it or not, on land, too, in the desert, which we'll get to in a second. It doesn't, you know, it sounds a little unusual, maybe. It doesn't maybe sound very safe to land on land in the desert, right? But I'll explain why and how they were able to do it in just a minute. Um, so that is actually a really great segue. Um, before we talk about the Apollo missions, though, which of course did come next after Gemini, I do want to skip ahead to another type of spacecraft that was used to go into space and then land back on Earth again. Um, and that actually is this next one here. So everyone, take a look at this. This beautiful thing right here is the Space Shuttle Enterprise. And we are actually very lucky to have this in our collection right up on our flight deck. This was the very first Space Shuttle ever built. It is the prototype orbiter, the very first one. And they were built when they were building these things, the main goal was to transport large things, things like satellites and telescopes and uh, pieces of the International Space Station. They needed to transport these things into space and also 
they needed to, you know, hold a few more people too, about seven or eight, like I said. So it also had on it this very big payload bay in the back. Um, so you had basically a kind of a capsule type thing in the front, but then this big empty, you know, you can kind of think of it like the trunk of a car or the back of a big truck. That payload bay was back there in order to um, store all of these large pieces of equipment, um, you know, like, again, satellites and telescopes and things. And when you're looking at this picture here, you can kind of see where the payload bay starts. Uh, if you look at the cockpit window right behind it, there's kind of like a, a seam there, kind of a line. It starts from right behind that cockpit and goes all the way back to kind of that rounded uh, engine part at the back there. So the majority of the space shuttle enterprise or any space shuttle is actually empty, believe it or not. Um, but everyone, I am going to tell you actually a big, deep, dark secret about this particular space shuttle. This space shuttle, unfortunately, never went into outer space. I know, it's true, but we do still love it so much. This was a testing vehicle. Again, it was a prototype. They needed to see if something this massive could actually even work and glide through the atmosphere. Uh, if you look closely at it, you can really see it's got kind of this airplane design. So they wanted it to be able to come in and land on a runway, just like an airplane. Um, and remember before the capsules that we had, they were actually one time use. They landed in the ocean and then were recovered. Maybe they sunk to the bottom of the ocean, but eventually they were recovered and put into museums, right? But with this new design, NASA could reuse it over and over and over again. And that was a really great thing for a while. Now, the Enterprise, like I said, did not go into space, but it did at least get into the sky. Here are some photos of an actual test flight that it did. Now, normally when these things go up, you know, it's attached to a rocket. We talked about rockets before, giant fuel tanks, lots of fire coming out the bottom. But this particular one did not use a rocket during its testing. This one instead actually got a piggyback ride from a 747 airplane. Back in 1977, this jet lumbered down the runway and eventually it took off with a space shuttle on its back. It went up to about 26,000 feet at about 470 miles an hour, which actually is not really that high or that fast. Commercial planes go much higher and faster than that. And then it, once it got up into space, basically it dropped it. And that's how it tested it. It separated and then the Enterprise became effectively a glider, just like a paper airplane. And uh, really all it had were the wings and the tail to help to manipulate it. So that's what it did. It just made banking turns to slow itself down. You know, as it's coming in, it just fell through the sky like a paper airplane before ultimately landing again, just like an airplane on a runway at an airport. So these shuttles, when they came back, they did not have any fuel or really any controls even other than the ability to just control their flaps on the wings and the tail um, just to let it kind of, you know, play with the air resistance and just kind of turn it slightly until it landed on its wheels on a runway like you can see here. Uh, so this picture is actually um, the Space Shuttle Columbia landing at Edwards Air Force Base on one of its earlier missions, too. So after NASA, though, was satisfied with all of their tests, right? They did make a few changes, but then they decided to create five other orbiters that were used to go into space. And in 2012, a year after they retired the space shuttle program, we were lucky enough to receive one of those remaining shuttles. Now, there are only four of those six still remaining on this Earth, and they are in museums across the country right now. There is one in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. There's one in Florida, um, Cape Kennedy. There's one uh, in California at the California Science Center. And of course, one right here at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. So please do come on by, check it out, and uh, you know see what it's all about. Get nose to nose, we like to say, with our space shuttle. Now, I will say, too, when the museum got the Enterprise back in 2012, we were so excited that we decided to celebrate it the same way that it all began, as you can see here, on the back of a 747 jet, doing a victory lap around Manhattan. <laughs> so if you happen to be in the city at that time, you might have actually even seen that incredible sight yourself, seeing a space shuttle on top of a 747 airplane flying around Manhattan. Just breathtaking, isn't it? And what I do love about this photo too, is if you look at that, that sight flying in the sky, and then you look directly under it, you can actually see the Intrepid back then. Looks a little bit different now because we've 
basically got a big shuttle pavilion there housing it. Uh, but if you look at that big white airplane, that's the Concorde. We still have that on our pier. And of course, the ship, you can see uh, the, the the runway there as it was uh, the back of the, the ship there. So there it is, the Intrepid. There it is, the beautiful Manhattan skyline as well. Now, I mentioned earlier, we had some other interesting things that were landing. After space shuttles, we didn't stop going into space, of course. In fact, we went back to using capsules just like this one. So this is a real Soyuz capsule. It is in our space shuttle pavilion right now, and it has actually been to outer space. You can actually see, if you look very closely at the top of it, there is a part that's a little bit lighter. All right, you kind of see some kind of like scorch marks, honestly, um, and that's what they are. It got a bit scorched on re-entry. Uh, it's very hot, lots of friction coming through the atmosphere, so there are some burn marks on it. Proof, it went into space. But this, what you're looking at here, is effectively what astronauts used to go into outer space after space shuttles. These capsules were sent up by Russia, and until recently, they basically just sold seats to the United States in order to get it up to the International Space Station. So again, this is called a Soyuz capsule, and there are three main parts to the Soyuz capsule, three main parts to it when it's in space. First of all, you've got the orbital module, so that is the thing that's going to connect to basically wherever you're going. Um, so in this case, you know, maybe it's the International Space Station. So that is where it's going to dock. Then the next thing you have is the re-entry module. That's the part that comes back home. Probably the most important part, I would say. And then the one, um, oh, and actually that's the one that we have in the museum as well, too. So that's the part that came back home. And then the last part, that white part there at the end, is the service module. And that has things like the heating and the cooling machinery and all of the other electrical components to make everything run smoothly. So... All right, let's say you are leaving the International Space Station. Let's say you're coming home uh, to finish your mission. So what you would do basically is climb into the re-entry module like our friends there on the left. You can see three astronauts crammed in there, super, super, super tight. But what is actually really interesting about those capsules, everyone, is that they don't land in the water like our earliest capsules. These ones actually took off from Kazakhstan near Russia, and they were sent up by, again, the Russian Space Agency. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to land it in the water, in the ocean, because if you think about it, Russia's not really near water, right? So instead, they landed in the desert. But because it's landing in dry land, they had to think a little bit differently. We are really thinking about safety here, right? So instead, it did have a little help from parachutes, again, that came out to slow it down, helping with the drag of the air, right? It slowed it down, but it also, if you look at this picture, had some explosives on the bottom. And you might think, oh, explosives, that doesn't sound very safe. Why would you want to have that? Um, but actually, they explode downward. They explode out away from the capsule, and it gives it a little last-minute boost to uh, kind of counteract some of that speed when coming in for that landing very quickly. So everyone, that is kind of a rundown of how we've landed spacecraft here on Earth, whether that be, you know, on land or on water. Next up, we are going to talk about landing on other places like the moon and other planets, too. But before we do that, everyone, I just want to pause here one more time and see if we've got any other questions, too. Anything about anything else that I've covered so far or just anything else at all? All right, yeah. Uh, why was the Soyuz capsule used? So, yeah, the Soyuz capsule was used because we stopped using space shuttles, really. Um, so, again, in 2011, they retired the space shuttle program. Uh, and it really just kind of came down to the fact that it was getting very expensive. Um, and it was also kind of dangerous. Unfortunately, we did lose two of our space shuttles uh, during the program and, and as well as the astronauts on board, too. So they decided... Maybe the risk, you know, didn't necessarily outweigh what they were doing at the time while using those space shuttles. Um, also, their funding, you know, was cut, which is often the reason that a lot of things end up going by the wayside. So it did come down to money, ultimately. And they realized it might just be easier to buy tickets, to buy seats on board these Soyuz capsules that were, um, you know, sent up by Russia to get to the International Space Station. Um, so many countries, you know, were, were all working together up there uh, on the ISS. So 
yeah, we all thought we'd work together too and use those Soyuz capsules to get there as well. And it's kind of ironic if you look back at the history of our space program, everything was really fueled by the space race, right? So starting off, um, you know, in, in the late 50s and the 60s, we were in this race with the Soviet Union um, and Russia was part of that. And uh, now here we are, you know, partnering with Russia later. So, you know, kind of come full circle. Very cool. Any other questions? How heavy was the space shuttle? Oh, yeah, very, very heavy. So, uh, again, this is this huge thing. You've got all this equipment first. So you've got the actual orbiter, the white thing, right, that we just looked at. Um, and then you've got the payload bay, right, so the part of that white or orbiter thing, um, but then anything that goes inside of the payload bay. So if you've got a satellite or you've got the Hubble Space Telescope or, you know, part of the International Space Station, that's actually how they built it in pieces like that. Um, that's going to add a lot more weight, right? Plus, then you've got all those other people on it, too, seven or eight people. Um, and then anything that they need to survive. So any food or anything else like that. It's going to be, uh, you know, taking up a lot, a lot of, a lot of weight going up there. Um, but I'll say this. So it is about uh, 165,000 pounds empty. Um, but with all of the fuel, everything else with the space shuttle stack completely, what you're looking at is closer to, um, I think it's about 4.4 million pounds. And, um, you know, this is this is why when you you saw those space shuttles going up, they had those giant fuel tanks. Um, they were attached with liquid fuel and solid fuel, and those tanks actually didn't even make it all the way into space either. Um, they burn off all the stuff that they have inside of it, and then they fall back down into the ocean to make it lighter too. Um, so the orbiter's up there, that white thing behind me here. It's up there, still going around the planet, and then again, it lands on the runway. Um, so there are components that can be reused, some of the rocket boosters, um, but other things just kind of burn up on reentry. Uh, but yeah, all together, all of those things are super, super heavy for sure. <laughs> all right. Great questions, everyone. Um, and yes, hello, Miles out in California. Thanks so much for the love. All right, guys. So as you may know, in 1969, the United States successfully landed humans on the moon. And it was, of course, these three guys right here. So we had boop, boop, Neil Armstrong on the left, Buzz Aldrin on the right, and Michael Collins in the center, who was the command module pilot, by the way. He's oftentimes forgotten, unfortunately. He definitely is a hero, I think, of the Apollo program. Um, but he, as the command module pilot, actually stayed in the capsule waiting to pick them back up again. So he didn't get to walk on the moon, but he was important. He was the most important. Uh, I like to say he was kind of like their getaway car, to be honest. Now, landing on the moon, though, was a lot different than landing on Earth. And why do you think that is? Tell me in the chat. Why do you think things might be a little bit different? What are some of these differences between the Earth and the moon? And why might that be a little bit more difficult to land things? Because even though the moon is pretty close to the Earth, relatively speaking, they are still extremely different. And things act a little differently on the moon than they do here on Earth. So yeah, that means landing is going to be just a bit different as well. First of all, the first thing that might come to mind to you is the terrain. It's completely different. There's no oceans of water like we have here on Earth. None of that softer landing stuff. No, no, this is, uh, this is something a little more serious here. You got to aim really well for this one. The moon has lots of rocky terrain, Lots of these craters, right? Um, these holes, because things smash into it all the time. It takes a lot of that space debris that actually might even come hit us, but it acts like a bodyguard for us at times. It actually shields us. So yeah, got a lot of impact craters. Probably wouldn't want your astronauts to land, uh, you know, in any of that rocky, jagged surfaces, right? That could be a little tricky. But also the Earth has an atmosphere right? That atmosphere helps to keep the air that we breathe in surrounding the planet. That's the reason actually that we use parachutes, right? In the first place, um, or it's the reason we can use parachutes at all to slow us down when we come through the atmosphere because it can catch all of that air. Well, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, can't hold on to all that air. So actually parachutes aren't going to do you much good up there at all. Also, Love this here. If you've ever seen footage of astronauts on the moon, they seem to bounce a lot, right? Doesn't that look fun? They do take a little bit longer to come back down. And that's because gravity is a bit different up there. It's about one sixth of what it is here on Earth. So that is definitely going to affect your landing strategy as well. 
So scientists had to think really creatively, really innovate, and they had to come up with something totally different. And this is what they designed. Take a look at this, something a little different. This is a model of what they actually put the first humans uh, up into space with and onto the moon. All right. And then also actually brought them home safely again, too. So again, it's a model. It's a smaller model. Um, but so again, if we're looking at this, let me make this a little bigger for you. Um, you'll see some similar components again. So first, again, you've got the service module. So we're kind of working in reverse now. The service module there was for the heating and the cooling and the electrical components down there at the bottom. Then we've got the command module. That's what comes back home again. That's what lands on the ocean. That triangular shaped thing. If you've ever seen pictures of the Apollo uh, capsules, that's what they looked like. And also kind of what the uh, the newer ones, the Orion ones kind of look like too. And then you've got this part up here, part number three, that is the lunar module or what is commonly referred to as the LEM. Now, when the Saturn V rocket took off, it only actually had on it parts one and two. There was another rocket that took up um, the, the last part and when they were in space and connected it, all right, that third part to the lunar module uh, or the lunar module to it. And how did they learn that docking maneuver, everyone? Well, that was one of the things that they were testing out during the Gemini missions, right? Baby steps. But the lunar module was actually an amazing vehicle because it was what ultimately landed us again on the moon. It was made on Earth, but it only ever actually was used in outer space. And in fact, they couldn't even test it. We didn't have the conditions of the moon to test it. So we were riding on a lot of science here. But this is what it looked like in reality. And I think, yeah, it does kind of look a little funny. Let me know in the comments uh, if you've, uh, you know, if you've ever seen anything like this before or if it looks like anything you've seen. Oftentimes, you know, when people see this, they think it maybe kind of looks like a, a spider. You know, you see those legs like a shiny spider uh, with those legs sticking out. But if you look closely, you can actually see that those legs are hinged. And that's actually important because they don't want the astronauts to go bouncing when they land to, you know, ricochet off the ground there. So it also used retro rockets. So rockets firing, you know, down um, instead of a parachute to slow it down to uh, power its descent. Again, parachute wasn't going to do much good on the moon with no atmosphere. And then eventually they were able to land on the moon. But the legs really did take a lot of shock on impact. So the astronauts you know, weren't going to be subjected to a lot of that ricochet and get hurt. So those legs were great. Um, but then, yeah, the rest is history. They did amazing work up there. And then when they were done, they climbed back into the lunar module, the top part up there. And uh, the golden part, actually, at the bottom, that part's called the descent stage. So that part is the thing that had the thrusters to power you down to the surface. Um, but that was actually only needed to land. They didn't need it anymore after that part. So the top part um, was the main part that they needed. Um, you know, looking at it to me, it kind of looks like, kind of like a face, kind of like the Transformers logo maybe. Um, but that top part there is called the Ascent Module. Okay, so you had the Descent Stage and the Ascent Module. So that part separates, it goes back up to meet with the Command Module, which is, remember, still floating around with Michael Collins inside up there, your getaway car, waiting for them to come up. So they go up. They connect up there and then they head right on back home and then they uh, safely landed again in the ocean where they were picked up again. So that is basically landing on the moon. Now, what about landing a little further away? What about something like Mars, right? Mars has been all over the news quite a bit in the past year because again, last year, actually one year ago, tomorrow, <laughs> uh, we landed the Perseverance rover there, and it is doing amazing things right now. But prior to Perseverance, we can't forget, of course, about two of the other most famous rovers that landed on Mars. We have, of course, let me make this real big for you so you can see them in all their glory. We have, of course, Spirit, and we have Opportunity. There they are. You see them? Yeah. Now, looking at these pictures, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Alicia. You made a mistake. That looks like the same image twice. 
But no, my friends, your eyes are not deceiving you. They are the twin rovers. They look exactly the same. They should have called them the Gemini rovers, right? So we sent twin rovers up to Mars. And now, everyone, we here are going to play a little game. So I am going to ask you a few questions about these rovers. Let's see how much you know about our Mars rover twins. I'm going to ask you a question. And then if you think that I'm talking about the spirit rover, Go ahead and type a one in the chat for me. And if you think I'm talking about the Opportunity Rover, go ahead and type a two in the chat for me. All right. All righty. So here we go, everyone. First question. Which of these went the furthest? All right. Which one traveled the furthest? Give me a one or a two in the chat. Do you think it was Spirit? Type a one. Or do you think it was Opportunity? Type a two. Now, both of these rovers were sent up to Mars to drive around the surface. Um, and there is actually a couple minutes delay between commands that we send on over there from Earth all the way up to Mars. Uh, but we can actually control rovers remotely from there on Earth. So go ahead and write your answers in the comments. Which one do you think went the farthest? One for spirit or two for opportunity? All right, give you a couple more seconds to get your answers locked in. One spirit, two opportunity. Which one went the furthest? All right. And the answer, everyone, is opportunity. Number two. Good job, Shampa, out there in the chat. Excellent. So this one went a grand total of 28 miles, whereas spirit, oh, we love spirit. It only went 4.8 miles. Yeah, not really so far, but there's actually a reason for that. Um, and that, you know, again, it's, it's not really that far, right? Because they did have some different things that they were looking at too, though. So that's okay. But um, we'll, we'll get to why the other one didn't go very far in just a second. All right, next up, next question. Which one got some help from something called a dust devil? Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, Mars does have lots and lots of dust across its surface, that red, rusty iron oxide dust. That's what gives it that very characteristic red color, right? And there are actually huge dust storms. So dust blows around there all the time, all across the planet, gets everywhere. What ended up happening here uh, was that <clears throat> um, the dust blew onto one of these rovers and onto its solar panel sensors. So that's where it gets its power from, right? And it blocked them. So it wasn't getting any power from the sun, unfortunately, covered in dust. And NASA's like, oh, man. Oh, no. OK, well, that's done. That's it. It's dead. We can't do anything. We can't, you know, bring a bring a vacuum cleaner over there or something. Right. But luckily, ironically, a dust devil came along. Basically, kind of think of it like a mini tornado of all this, you know, swirling dust and wind. It came over and it just happened to blow right all over it um, and get that dust off of the panels and brought it back to life. Amazing. So there you go. Um, this is actually something that happened last month, actually. Uh, Perseverance and Ingenuity were having some issues up in Mars because of another huge dust storm going by. So we're still dealing with this every day. But thinking about these two here, which one do you think it was? Was it Spirit Type 1 or Opportunity Type 2? Which got some help from a dust devil? All right. <clears throat> Enter your uh, answers. One or two. And the answer is... Spirit, number one. And since you're probably very curious, everyone, here's a picture of the dust devil. Again, this is this swirling column of dust that moves across the surface. There are some that are much, much bigger than this as well, but uh, kind of cool. Kind of reminds me of like, you know, it's a little tornado, like little Tasmanian devil or something like that swirling along, uh, but very fortuitous that it happened to you know, perfectly come in, in contact with our uh, our rovers up there to wipe off some of the dust off of its solar panels. Okay, next question. Which one of these had a broken wheel that made a great discovery? Hmm, was it spirit or was it opportunity? Type a one or a two. Which one had a broken wheel? And because the wheel was broken, it helped us to figure out something really special about Martian soil. Hmm. If you remember one of our earlier questions, you might recall that one of them did not go quite as far as the other one. Sometimes when you got a broken wheel, that might uh, have something to do with it. So what do you think, everyone? Do you think it was spirit type one or opportunity type two? Which one had a broken wheel that made a great discovery? Okay, and we got some answers coming in the chat. And the answer is... Number one, spirit again. So spirit had a broken wheel that helped us to discover something very cool. Take a look at this. All right. So looking at this, you're probably wondering, yep, 
that looks like dirt. <laughs> well, it's more than that. They studied this particular dirt because as Spirit was moving along, it was you know, dragging its poor little broken wheel behind it. And it actually uncovered this under the surface of Mars there. Silicates, all right? Silicates are a really, really good indicator of the presence of life. So, of course, this does not mean that there currently is life there, but that maybe at one point in the past, Mars might have had life. And we found that out actually very much thanks to that little broken wheel. So there you go. Sometimes when there's accidents, they happen to be very helpful too. Accidents can oftentimes lead to perfection later. So embrace those, right? All right, last question, everyone. Which rover had the longer mission length? Now, both of these rovers were launched in the summer of 2003, pretty very much close to each other. So which one had the longer mission length? All right, was it Spirit Type 1 or was it Opportunity Type 2? Which one had the longer mission length? Hmm. We've got a lot of stuff here today. We had broken wheels. We had dust devils. Which one had the longer mission length? All right, give, give you a couple uh, last seconds to get your answers in. And five, four, three, two, one. The answer is opportunity. Good job, Shampa. Yeah, the answer is opportunity. Opportunity had a longer mission. Spirit's mission was six years long. Again, probably because of all the prog pro uh, problems that it was having. Um, and um, opportunity, though, um, was 16 years long. So a lot longer, um, but both really amazing. They both did a lot of really, really incredible work for NASA along the way. And we love our Mars rovers, every last one of them, right? Now, here's another question. How did they land on Mars, right? Because Mars is different than Earth, different than the moon, right? There's no oceans, again, that we know of. And also different from the moon, Mars has gravity, right? Um, again, it's got, well, the moon does as well, but it's got more. It's got a little less than Earth, but it is there a little more significantly. Um, and also, though, different than the moon, it has an atmosphere. Now, granted, it is a lot thinner than the atmosphere that we have here on Earth. Um, and also, you know, we are landing something that is somewhere really, really, really far away. So there's going to be a little bit of a delay between when we send signals and when it receives it and knows what to do next. Um, kind of, you know, trying to find your way around with your eyes closed, right? But this is how they did it. Um, so look at this, everyone. This is actually something that's kind of similar to the Soyuz capsule. They sent out, you know, the things there. They had these parachutes to slow it down. And they also fired, again, as you can actually see, these retro rockets, again, shooting away from the capsule to help to slow it down even more and to stabilize itself like the lunar lander, right, or the Soyuz capsule. But even further down in this picture, you can actually see something that kind of looks like a bunch of grapes hanging at the bottom. All right, so take a look at that. There's the grapes. All right, inside of those grapes is actually where the rover is. So there are these big balloon things. They actually bounce. They bounce around and they bounce around the surface of Mars until as they're bouncing there, they're flying up in the air and they're bouncing down until they finally are able to settle into a nice little resting area. And then all of those little grape balloons, they deflate, they shrivel up, kind of look like raisins or I don't know, kind of like a brain there if you look at that. Um, and then that opens up to reveal this little golf cart sized rover. All right. And that, everyone, is how we were able to land some of those early rovers, right? Um, but these aren't the last things that we've sent to Mars, right? The last two things, actually, three things technically. We that we sent were Curiosity and also Perseverance and its accompanying little best buddy, Ingenuity, the helicopter, which was basically strapped to its belly the whole time. Now, they got onto Mars a little bit differently, and I'm going to show you how. So I'm actually going to show you a side-by-side -side video of both Curiosity and the latest rover, Perseverance, landing on Mars. Um, the one that you're going to see on the left is a computer animation, and then the one that you're going to see on the right are actual visuals from the Perseverance landing one year ago tomorrow in February of 2021. But they call this segment of the trip the seven minutes of terror. This is going to be a little sped up, though. It's not going to be the whole seven minutes. They call it the seven minutes of terror because during this time period, we do not know 
what is going on. All right. We have lost communication. Um, we don't know what's going on with the rover. We lose communication because of the interference with the Martian atmosphere um, until later, which, of course, is now how I am able to show you this footage, courtesy of NASA. All righty, everyone. So here we go. Let me go ahead and pull up this video for you. All right. So here we are. The first thing that happens is the straighten up maneuver as it comes into the atmosphere. It's going to correct itself, put its most bottom facing portion um, towards the ground because that's going to generate a lot of friction, a lot of heat, right? So if you take your hands and you rub them together, right, you can actually kind of generate some friction, see what that feels like. But we want to make sure that we're safe from this heat. So there is a heat shield there to help to deflect it. That's going to help it to spread it away from the main part of the capsule. So once it starts to stabilize, it's still moving really, really fast, 430 meters per second. So to avoid crash landing, it deploys the parachute. So now you can see the footage. There they go. This fun fact, though, this orange and white parachute has a message in binary code. It says, dare mighty things. That's the motto of the NASA JPL lab in California. And then you might have noticed right after that, there we go. There comes the heat shield. So we don't need that anymore. But that also comes off because there is radar and a camera on the bottom of the rover. And it's actually taking pictures of the Mars terrain as it's coming in for a landing. It's checking in real time to make sure that there is a safe place to land. and There's no rocks or hazardous terrain in the way of the landing spot. So now it's actually locking its radar onto the ground using something called terrain relative navigation. It's finding a nice smooth place to land. And as it continues to descend with its parachute, it's going to start priming its landing engines, getting ready to separate. And then at about two and a half kilometers, they don't need the parachutes anymore. So it detaches. Keep an eye out for that. It's going to go soon. All right. It's coming in again. It's got that terrain, uh, you know, it's locking on, trying to find a good spot. It doesn't need its parachutes anymore. It's going to actually get rid of the parachutes and then fire the retro rockets to slow down even more and move it into the best landing spot. All right, so there go the parachutes. But again, those rockets can't get too close to the surface. We still need to make sure that there's not a lot of shock when the rover lands because we don't want it to break. Right. So they pull out um, this thing called the sky crane. All right. It's about 20 meters off the surface now. And that sky crane is actually going to lower it to the ground before it safely separates. And there it goes. There's the sky crane lowering it down. And there it goes. It's so close. There it goes. Yay. And there you have it. And then everyone cheers. <laughs> Touchdown. That is, of course, the best moment for everyone. All of that stress is now done because, yes, it has landed. It has landed in one piece. But really, at that point, you know, the journey has just begun, right? Um, so, everyone, um, this last image here that I'll show you now. There we go. Love this image here. Um, this is actually a selfie taken by Perseverance on its robotic arm back in April of last year. So a few months after it had been there. Perseverance is the latest rover to land on Mars. And again, it will be celebrating what I like to call its landiversary tomorrow. It's the one year anniversary of landing on the red planet. Its mission is specifically to search for signs of life, past or present. And something else really cool about Perseverance is that it has with it its little friend, this little drone helicopter that you can see in the selfie, too, in the background. It's named Ingenuity, and that uh, is actually flying around on the surface of Mars as we speak. It's done, I think, about uh, almost 20, 20 flights so far. They're short little stints, but amazing for us to be able to learn about, again, the atmosphere and what is capable, how the air is there. Um, and of course, those parachutes are very helpful for that too. So we are doing unbelievable things right now that we have never done before. And roaming around the surface of Mars, Guy guys, technology is so, so cool, right? And actually, here's another fun fact um, about this particular mission and, and these guys here. Um, they actually attached a small piece of the wing covering from the Wright Brothers' original 1903 Wright Flyer. So the very first powered aircraft on Earth, um, they attached it to a cable under the helicopter's solar panel. So there's actually, you know, kind of a little, a little homage to our first steps uh, of flight here on Earth but up there on Mars, our first flight on Mars. So cool. Uh, and also actually another fun fact, in 1969 um, for the moon landing, Neil Armstrong also carried something similar um, from the Wright Flyer to the moon in the lunar module as well. So, so cool. So amazing. Um, all right, everyone. So, um, 
you know, I want to pause one more time, see if we've got any other questions um, before uh, before wrapping up for today. All right, let's see if we've got any other ones. Have the rovers come back from Mars? So no, actually, once they're there, they stay there. That's it for now. Mars is pretty far away, and it does take a little over eight months just to get there. Um, and also, we don't really have anything to launch them from Mars back home to us, unfortunately. So yeah, they send us data back through signals. But um, but I do think, actually, I know, like the plans coming up eventually in a few years, um, once we do have you know, astronauts, maybe once it sends astronauts to the surface of Mars, certainly one of their missions will be to bring back some of those smaller things, um, things like Pathfinder, right, which is a really small rover that went up before the twin rovers, um, bringing home anything of sentimental value, of course. Um, but also Perseverance is taking samples of Mars right now. Um, it is the first to actually collect and, and cache and keep um, some of these samples. So the plan ideally actually would be to be able to send something over there that would be able, I don't know, they were saying maybe there was a way they could um, take them and, you know, kind of uh, Super Bowl was recently, right? You take those samples and kind of, you know, throw them up into the sky and then something up there would be able to, you know, catch it um, and then send it back home again. So maybe remotely collecting those samples. But certainly once we actually step foot on Mars, um, I know the plan is to collect some of these things that we've got roving around up there right now too. Great question. Any others? Is someone controlling the probes like a remote control car? Oh, yeah. So I, essentially, yes, actually. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, there is a delay. So you kind of have to wait for that signal to go before the rover can hear it and accept the command, right? Um, which means you really got to pay attention to what it's sending back, right? You don't want to end up in a ditch somewhere upside down, right? Imagine you've got like a remote control car, right? Just like you said, and, you know, it flips upside down. Well, that means you got to go over there. You got to turn it upside down. You got to fix it, right? But we can't just pop over to Mars to flip it over, <laughs> right? So we got to be really careful. And if you look at actually the map, the uh, the terrain really of all of the areas that um, it's gone so far in the past year, it's not that wide, um, which might surprise people. But it's again, it's doing a lot of work. It's uh, it's drilling up some samples. And you've got Ingenuity who's actually flying around ahead, scoping out some uh, some spaces for it to go explore next. Um, but it's taking its time. We're being very careful because the Perseverance rover is uh, pretty cool, pretty sweet. Um, so actually, though, on that note, everyone, I do have something very, very cool to share with you all. Um, I'm curious, you know, let me know in the chat. Uh, has anyone ever, you know, wished that you could see the Perseverance River rover or uh, the Ingenuity helicopter up close? You know, like really get a good look at it, walk around it, maybe even get a selfie with it, right? Well, my friends, guess what? Now you can. The Intrepid Museum is so excited to announce that we currently have a full-scale model of NASA's Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter in our space shuttle pavilion as part of NASA's nationwide Roving with Perseverance Rove Show. Road show. <laughs> they should call it a rove show, right? Um, and, you know, something else I just think is so cool. Where else can you say, if you come to the museum and see it, where else can you say that you saw a Mars rover on an aircraft carrier under a space shuttle? Huh? <laughs> so check out this amazing footage. This is actually, um, this was taken just earlier this week um, from the installation of it. And it's actually really amazing. Um, I was very surprised when I saw it. Uh, it's about the size of a car. Look how big it is. It's amazing. So um, yeah, definitely come on by. Check it out. We're going to have that actually up on display through June 15th. Um, definitely something to check out. It's incredible. We've got the rover as well as, there it is, that little Ingenuity helicopter as well, um, right there on display for you to see right up close and personal. Anything else about it that surprises you? I have to say, again, the size really stood out to me and just how white it is. All those pictures that you see, it's, you know, it's covered in that iron oxide dust, right? It's uh, It looks a little darker. I just wasn't expecting it to be so bright. Um, and of course, we've got, you know, all those those uh, bright lights on it, too. So that definitely um, is part of it. So awesome. Uh, all right, my friends. So that concludes, sadly, our stellar spacecraft program for today. If you've got any other questions about our programs, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through our social media. 
on that note, everyone, we will be going on hiatus for a while to prepare for some awesome new 40th anniversary content that we're going to be sharing with you. Did you know? It is our 40th anniversary this year, by the way, for the museum. So while this was our last streaming Intrepid Adventure for now, don't worry, you can always check back on our archive content on YouTube and Facebook as well. You can stay tuned, um, though, also for some other really amazing upcoming programming as well. Which, speaking of, later on tonight at 5 p.m., so in just about an hour, we've got our next Virtual Astronomy Live. There it is. Uh, our Virtual Astronomy Live this month, we are actually celebrating, appropriately, the one-year anniversary, land anniversary. you can borrow that, uh, of the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter. And we're actually going to be chatting tonight with the Ingenuity helicopter team leader, who's going to give us updates and talk all about his experiences working on the helicopter, including what's going on right now up there, the dust storms, and also maybe even give us a little teaser for the future of space helicopters, if you're into that. So that is tonight in just about an hour. The pre-show starts at 5 p.m. with yours truly. I'll be talking all about some of the really cool pop cultural phenomena phenomenon of Mars in our everyday life. That'll be on our streaming platforms as well as on nasaspaceflight.com. Also, everyone, I want to plug that starting up um, next, this coming, oh my gosh, I, I can't even keep track of the time. This Saturday, this Saturday, February 19th through 26th, it's Kids Week. We are back. It is back and we are moving full steam ahead with activities and programs for the whole family all week long. So we are going to have astronauts and scientists and engineers from NASA on site for those first three days for NASA days. Um, and they're going to be giving demonstrations and talks. We're going to have astronaut Victor J. Glover Jr. who's going to be there. He most recently was just on the SpaceX um, Crew Dragon uh, capsule with uh, resilience. He went up to the International Space Station. So he's going to be there talking about what it was like to live in space. And we're also going to have a ton of other really amazing partners ranging from zoo animals, you heard me right, to Broadway shows and a whole bunch of other fun stuff the rest of the week. So once again, don't miss it. Um, it is starting up this Saturday, February 19th. So in just two days. Uh, and that's going to run for, for eight days long. So all the way through Saturday of next week, too. So for more information about Kids Week or any of our other upcoming programs or events, please do visit our website, intrepidmuseum.org. All right, my friends. So once again, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alicia. I will be signing off for now, but I'm sure that we'll see each other again soon for another intrepid adventure. See you later, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in and supporting us. Bye.